Buongiorno a tutti. Good afternoon to all of you who are present here, all of you who are connected remotely. I wanted to welcome the President of the Assembly of the Portuguese Republic, the other Presidents from National uh, Parliaments, Commissioner Skinners, and it is a great pleasure to welcome, uh, welcome you all taking part in the second interparliamentary high-level uh, conference on migration and asylum. As I was saying to my colleague, the President of the Portuguese Republic, Eduardo Ferro Rodriguez, who has promoted and organized this conference in cooperation with the other uh, presidents and uh, national presidents during their presidency, uh, Mr. Pre President the president of the uh, Slovene National Parliament and uh, Professor Valkan Schobler from the German Bundestag. As I was saying, I would like to thank you for having come here for this, uh, na this conference. The second point is this pandemic. We don't want to stop here. We've got to keep going, talking about the management of uh, as migration and asylum. And we wanted to do this by involving the external element of migration. We want to look at the world surrounding us, the reasons why millions of people in the world are moving. And we often see uh, Europe as uh, a target, a place for a better life. So this image of the European Union as a land of opportunity, the land of freedom, of prosperity, this has to make us think about things, think about our strengths, think about our responsibility. And they've got to make us more aware of the economic and political instruments we have available to manage with our partners within the world, uh, human, uh, the mobility, the, mo the movement of people. Uh, there has to be solidarity. We have to be uh, attentive to the rights of individuals, of people, because as we've said many times, behind each person, every elderly person, every woman, every child, there's a history and there's a story which we must respect. And I think that this meeting can help us to look at this situation and deal with the management of populations, movements in a humane way. And the impact of the COVID pandemic has had on these people over the last year and a half. I'm convinced that if we listen to our different points of view in this high-level interparliamentary meeting, we can find common ground to even make some uh, bold, innovative choices which can give the European Union at last a common policy on migration and asylum. And we can start with opinions that our MEPs have been democratically elected by our citizens. We've chosen today to discuss the the external dimension of migration and uh, asylum policies, because we only know that if we look at this only by looking at instability, at the crisis, at abuse, at uh, abuse of human rights, things that are happening beyond our borders, only then can we start looking at the roots, at the causes, understand them and understand why millions of people are still set off. And then we'll see how the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, is having a great impact on the, the, uh, these migra migratory movements locally and on the world level. This multiply effect of the people who are moving, especially in areas where there's no guarantee of access to treatment and to cures. The pandemic has stopped, has blocked migrants, stopped these flows. It has destroyed jobs and it's destroyed income. It's blocked the migrants. It's reduced the money they would send home. And it has pushed millions of people, vulnerable populations, pushing them down towards policy. Migration and asylum are already a, a, a fundamental part of the external action of the EU. But they have to become part of a more cohesive 
foreign policy for the EU. We are the first donors during the Syrian crisis, right from at the start, 10 years ago. This year, it's the fifth conference on the future of Syria and the region, and it's promoted by the EU and the UN. The EU and uh, its member states have put 3.7 billion euros of the total of 5.3 billion euros. And the EU is the largest contributor worldwide for the uh, Syrian crisis, 24.9 billion euros, uh, which we have uh, offered for humanitarian aid, helping displaced people in Syria, in the region, seeking uh, to stabilize what is unstable. Uh, this important economic effort for people is just a drop in the sea if we don't know how to uh, have a political and a diplomatic action as well so that Syrians will have the right to decide of their own future, decide for their own country, which is only right and fair, to support... a. a an action for stability so that Syria can again be a safe place and the refugees, displaced people can go home in safety. Today, Syria is not safe and none of our member states can uh, consider it safe. In Libya, too, the EU has been working with the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees with the uh, my International Organization for Migrant my, my, with the people who are being detained in government um, it's institutions. And often we suffer when we see those images. We're trying to guarantee protection to people who have a right to protection. So we need to support those who want to go back, want to go home. We've supported Ni Niger when it was trying to deal with all the people who are arriving after this lengthy travel through uh, the desert, which is preceded, which then will uh, be, they will be detained in uh, Libya, and they then manage to leave and probably die at sea. We've helped the migrants who have arrived in Italy. We've tried to support them, but we need a common policy to stabilize uh, Libya and to make the Sahel safe. And we need to do this with our allies, with our African um, partners. It's the not individual actions. This has to be a component of a diplomatic action of the EU, of an EU foreign policy. We've got to go beyond our divisions. And we must not be just a global donor, but a political actor, a glo um, global political actor. The world and the Mediterranean need a stable and democratic Libya that has to decide for its own future. And we, too, would like to invite again foreign powers who are present in Libya to not interfere in the peace process and to reduce their military presence. A foreign policy which should put at its centre people, human development, democracy, rights, safety, security, combating climate change. And within this context, this new pact on asylum and migration proposed by the European Commission last September stressed a cooperation with the countries of origin and countries of transit of the migratory flow on the basis of bilateral partnerships, uh, aid to development, which must have at the centre the management of uh, a legal movement of people. And we need global partnerships. They have to be transparent. They have to be subject to a democratic control so that our parliaments can exercise their own power, uh, power the, the authorities of the budget, of control. Uh, and monitor and auditing. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, even today we see these people arriving on, uh, on these boats across the sea and they swim on the shore in Spain or they come through the Balkans and they come through the French Alps. I think it's our duty to save lives, to save men and women. It's no longer acceptable to leave this responsibility only to NGOs. 
which I, I just uh, was giving a slight uh, giving support. We've got to have a, a policy, a common policy within the Mediterranean to save people, to cut out these traffickers. We need a European method of search and rescue at sea. And secondly, we must guarantee that needy people should be able to arrive in the Union without risking their lives. They have to be able to come safely. We need humanitarian channels, humanitarian corridors that have to be defined with the UN. Uh, we have to work hand in hand to a European system for re-establishing these people. It has to be based on our common responsibility. We're talking about people who can even give us some a big contribute they can contribute to our economies it contribute to our recovery for our societies economies that have been hit by the pandemic by the demographic fall to the drop in the birth rate and thanks to their skills and to their work to their desire to live with us and thirdly we have to set up a European policy for welcoming these migrants. We have to define together the criteria. For example, a single type of permit, a single permit for entrance and for staying. Let's assess this uh, at the national level with the needs of our labour market of our individual labour markets. During the pandemic, whole sectors were blocked for the lack of migrant workers. We need a regulated migration for the recovery of our societies if we want our systems to uh, hold, and we need social protection. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to go beyond the Dublin system. We need a real cooperation between the member states based on a permanent mechanism for solidarity, sharing and responsibility. Without a European policy, COVID has shown us, it's taught us, you can't deal with global crisis, global challenges. No one can do it alone. And no one must be left alone either. The role of the national parliaments is essential in this. I'm certain that today's meeting will continue with the process, which is very satisfactory, the process of cooperation between national parliaments and European parliament in the sector uh, of migration and asylum. So even though we are strengthening our interinstitutional cooperation, it also respects our individual powers. And this cooperation between European Parliament and, pa and national parliaments is essential to give the right response so that a new common policy on uh, migration and asylum will allow our member states, allow our territories and our regions to deal with one of the greatest challenges of our times. Allow me to conclude by thanking you again for your participation in this meeting and uh, uh, wishing you all the best for your work and, to, and especially for the panels which will take place today. Thank you and I will now give the floor to my friend President Eduardo Ferro Rodriguez, who is President of the Assembly of the Portuguese Republic. Thank you all for your attention. Senhor Presidente do Parlamento Europeu, David Sassoli. Honorable President of the European Parliament, Mr. Sassoli, from Lisbon and the Portuguese. Parliament, I'd like to extend my warmest welcome and also I'd like to welcome representatives from the Slovenian National Assembly and the German Bundestag. The reason why we're meeting here today is a reason of considerable importance, something which is very much strikes to the heart of what we are in the European Union and what is set out in the Lisbon Treaty, especially in Article 2. And we think it is important to understand 
what it is to be part of the international community. In 2020, we uh, saw a proposed new pact for asylum and migration. It's a very important document, and it's very important that the European Union find a consensus on this. The High Representative for R Refugees, Filippo Grandi, recalled that this pact is giving Europe an opportunity to prove that the fundamental right of asylum is being uh, validated and those who require international protection should be given it and of course there's a degree of responsibility that has to be assumed for these people. The Portuguese presidency took up this topic of asylum and migration and we've dedicated a great deal of attention to it and in this context maybe I can remind you of the ministerial meeting and conference on migratory flows from the 11th of May. The European summit will also discuss this issue and I assume that the blue card for professional qualifications will be established. Migration is a cross-cutting topic and the COVID-19 pandemic is as well. Of course COVID has had a big impact on migration, um, especially the external dimension. In this pandemic we've been able to see that one of the fundamental principles of the European Union is being affected and that is the free movement of people. The single market is also affected, but mostly it's a question of affecting the mobility of university students, and in a recent study on Erasmus you can see that. The restriction of the free movement of persons is not just one that has existed between member states, but actually within the national borders of member states. These restrictions, of course, have been extended to the external borders of the European Union, and these are at one of the same time national borders as well. The geographical location of certain member states has uh, inherent with their position the situation that they are more strongly exposed to migratory flows and humanitarian dramas linked to asylum and migration. Frontex and other European agencies have been uh, on the front line in dealing with these issues. It's not just a question of security and safety, but also a question of uh, respecting the values of the European uh, Union and international law. The pandemic has meant that the asylum and migration issues have come to the fore once again and have hit our societies hard. These are aspects that of course can't be left unaddressed. The situation in the migratory camps for example, let's not forget that migrants play an important role in our collective life. How many public services and private companies use migra migrants as employees? In the framework of legal migration, this is also important. We know that in coming years, we're going to have a shortfall of uh, workers and that we'll have to turn to third countries to recruit staff. Filippo Grandi said that a well-organized, well-executed humanitarian policy will help us exit this uh, corona crisis. Let us not forget developing countries as well. There's a question of providing vaccines to these countries. Let's not forget what Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the United Nations said. Nobody will be safe until all of us are safe. Of course there's also a question of GDP. In 2020 more than 14 billion Africans, uh, for, sorry, 14 million Africans who have fallen under the poverty line. They 
earn less than $1.95 per day. And hence, we need a comprehensive and coherent policy throughout the European Union. That means we have to have well-balanced, far-reaching solutions that will benefit both sides, both the countries of origin, the countries of transit as well. And it's important that we have a concomitant visa policy and also policies for trade and foreign investment. So we need to have a, a dialogue and act in solidarity and showing responsibility. And I hope that this conference uh, is a success. And so greetings once again from Lisbon. And I hope that we will also be able to provide a contribution for the European Union and for the member states. Thank you. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, President Federico Rodriguez. And now we're going to hear from uh, the uh, President of the National Assembly in Slovenia. Uh, good morning to you. President of the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Sassoli, and President uh, of uh, the Assembly of Republica Portuguesa, Mr. Ferro Rodriguez, uh, and President of the Bundestag, Mr. Schäuble, and Vice President of the European Commission, Mr. Schinas. Dear MEPs, dear colleagues, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you during this second interparliamentary uh, conference on migration and asylum organized uh, during the Portuguese presidency. As I've already had the opportunity to state in November during the first conference, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has seriously aggravated uh, the issues relating to migration and asylum and reminds us uh, of the most uh, significant parts of European policy in the field, which is why I'm pleased that the first part of the conference uh, was dealing with that question. Migratory flows have been reduced over the 15 past months due to restrictions in traveling for individuals and because of the sanitary measures in place. However, the uh, safety of the migrants has also increased. The risks that they are exposed to are increased uh, by the sanitary risks uh, and uh, by various forms of racism and exclusion. I would also stress that Slovenia attaches great importance to protecting migrants uh, and health protection from uh, uh, the consequences of COVID-19. We explain the measures to them in their languages and the work is well organized and Slovenia does assure access to vaccination to everyone, including the migrants. It must be said, of course, that the pandemic has aggravated the economic and social situation in the various uh, countries of origin. And this will be another factor that will contribute to, to further migration, which is why we need to attach great importance uh, to the external dimension of migration. As part of that, Slovenia supports a comprehensive approach uh, dealing with migration based on a partnership arrangement uh, with the countries of origin, the countries of transit, uh, and uh, the countries of destination. One needs to realize uh, that migration policy needs to be part of the general cooperation that we have with the countries of origin. We also need to think in terms of uh, growing jobs and growing the economies in these countries, uh, thus contributing towards uh, the stability of the countries of origin. And I am pleased to see the progress that has been made during the course of the Portuguese presidency. Last December, the Commission published a, a communication on the Migration and Asylum Pact. I would like there to be more progress made uh, 
compared to what has now been achieved, and over the past weeks the situation has changed so radically that we can afford to be moderately optimistic. The Slovenian presidency will do its level best to make further headway in the field of migration and asylum. We're perfectly aware that this is one of the most pressing issues of the day in the European Union. We are equally aware that the negotiations uh, on these complex issues uh, will be lengthy. We're going to address a, a comprehensive uh, management uh, of migration with a full operation uh, throughout the, the Schengen area. Furthermore, we want to include enlargement uh, towards uh, the Western Balkans, uh, which uh, is another priority of ours. For us and for migration, management, proper cooperation with this region will be of great importance. Ladies and gentlemen, Slovenia will carry on organizing the Interparliamentary Conference at the high level on migration and asylum. We also hope that an Interparliamentary Conference uh, will be organized uh, during each uh, presidency. Migration has become a daily topical issue, and it will continue to accompany us in the years ahead. Uh, therefore, we, we must adopt our policies accordingly. One must also be aware of the fact is that our expectations uh, from the, the Migration and Asylum Pact uh, will not be the end of our work by any means. Beyond that, we need to ensure effective implementation practical implementation, which will constitute yet another challenge. Allow me to make a call to you to please come to the upcoming conference to be organized uh, by the National Assembly in cooperation uh, with the European Parliament uh, in the month of November. We will be organizing this conference on important issues, key issues, and we will do everything possible so that the Interparliamentary Conference uh, remains the high-level platform uh, for exchange of views. I now give the floor to Vagant Schreuder, President of the Bundestag. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Berlin, the German Bundestag. In December last year, just a month after the first interparliamentary conference on migration and asylum in Europe, on occasion of that visit, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio, Antonio Gutierrez, said, the pandemic has exposed deep fractures, inequalities, unfairness, insufficient social security, everywhere the most vulnerable are suffering most. I'd like to thank the Portuguese and Slovenian colleagues for having taken up the baton of this interparliamentary conference and put these issues front and center of their presidencies and continue to focus on these. Following the 2015 migration crisis, COVID-19 has meant for all of us, as I said at the time, a further rendezvous with globalization. The health crisis with its very far-reaching ramifications in all areas of our society is worsening the worldwide social and political conflicts that exist. They are threatening progress in development and they are destabilizing weak public economies not least because the monetary transfers of millions of migrants have been stopped. And by the way, there's a worldwide risk of an increase in sh food shortages and famine. This has worsened if you just, uh, for example, look at the world market prices that, for agricultural products that are skyrocketing. And if there's a lock lack of prospects, then the pressure for migration will increase. The number of people who want to find their path to Europe is increasing once again via the Balkan route, 
via the Mediterranean through the Sahel region. And this virus has exacerbated the already poor conditions that these people are suffering from anyway, people who are fleeing their countries, and unfortunately these conditions also reign in those camps where they arrive. Mm -hmm. And regardless of these challenges, what we have achieved to date has really not met the needs of what we would expect to have been done by now. The European Asylum Agency may be able to give some good signals. The m new Migration and Asylum Pact that we've been talking about in November is already obsolete, however. Europe needs an appropriate policy to deal with migration, a European asylum right with unitary standards, with recogni recognition and distribution keys, which we can agree on, but we block one another on these issues. Often we leave it up to the member states of the European Union have external borders to face this onslaught themselves. Now, it is up to Europe as a whole to act. We have to find common solutions for m migration and asylum uh, policies. We're facing a dilemma. The suffering and death on these migration routes are things we should not turn a blind eye to if we see ourselves in a self-evident position as being part of a, a union built on values. Any life lost means that the European Union is losing a degree of credibility. But let's not either give rise to any false hopes, false incentives for people to come to Europe. We have to stop the criminal activities of smugglers and militia and prevent migrants from being exposed to this sort of violence and crime. We also have to ensure that people who have no possibility of remaining legally in the EU, that they be quickly and consistently returned to their home countries. In many transit and uh, countries of origin, we'll only make progress if we cooperate with regimes which do not meet the same democratic standards that we espouse. We have to have the highest amount of democracy and humanitarian understanding when we're dealing in this way. But there are still moral costs, ladies and gentlemen, that we will have to assume because we don't have any other partners to deal with. Given the global long-term ramifications of COVID, we as Europeans are all the more called on to stabilize our relations with our neighbors, to make sure that the economic and environmental developments are supported, democracy and the rule of law be promoted and bolstered. The migration partnerships that the Commission is proposing could help if we can manage to implement them in a convincing fashion. And that really comes down to us. The national parliaments and our governments need to be pressed into service here. We have a contribution to make. We have to make sure that there's more commonality so that when it comes to the future of the European Union, these central issues are dealt with in an appropriate way. I hope that today's exchange will help us along this path. And with those words, I hope that this conference has every success. Very well. Thank you, President Schäuble. Now we're going to open the floor for a debate. Over to the Commissioner, Margarita Skinas, who is the President of uh, the Commission for the Promotion uh, of uh, uh, European Values. Over to you. Thank you, President Sassoli. President Sfero Rodriguez, dear President Zorzic, Dr. Schäuble, it's a great honor and a pleasure to join you today for this very timely discussion on the EU migration and asylum policy and in particular the external dimension of our migration policies. Let me start by saying that this is the moment probably to bring national parliaments closer at the heart of the discussion 
For a long time, the discussion of migration policies in Europe has always been considered as something that is limited to uh, the Brussels bubble and the Brussels community. I think this is an issue per se that transcends uh, the confines of the European institutions. It requires a major paradigm shift and national parliaments and members of national parliaments are an essential part of this debate. So I'm, I'm particularly happy and delighted that we can have this discussion at the uh, interparliamentary dimension it merits. If there is one thing that we learned in Europe since 2015-16 uh, uh, refugee crisis is, as some of the previous speakers uh, raised, is that migration and asylum is not a question that any member state can answer alone. Effective solutions require collective European action, shared objectives, a communality of understanding. And these shared objectives should go beyond the very often politically toxic debate we are witnessing in certain parts of Europe, which is short-sighted, based on isolationist rhetoric, which confines migration policy to a binary choice of us against them, and seeks to perpetuate the absence of a common, well-functioning, holistic and cohesive European policy. The second thing we found out is that when we design the future of the European asylum and migration policies, the external dimension cannot be an accessory cannot be an afterthought. It has to be integrally interwoven at the heart of our overall thinking. And it's not a coincidence that we are discussing this this morning, and it's not a coincidence that next week uh, the leaders of the European Union and the upcoming European Council will have exactly the same discussion. Uh, let me start with uh, our pact for the migration and asylum, which we presented last September. And let me start by saying that I, I truly appreciate uh, the almost universal praise that we are getting on the starting point for a new European migration and asylum policy as described in the pact. This is the first time that we put on the table a comprehensive, holistic, seamless circuit type of policy, where everything connects to everything else, from better management of our external borders to fair and effective procedures internally in the European Union and a significantly reinforced external dimension. The pact is the only way out of the current problem. But we need to be very clear on how this external dimension of the pact will be structured. Because this is the first floor of the three-store building that we want to construct, the second floor being borders and the third solidarity. But we need to build this first floor of external dimension sufficiently resilient so that we can withhold the whole architecture. That's why we want to put centrally in this first floor the this issue of balanced and mutually beneficial partnerships tailor-made to each partner's country-specific needs, especially of countries of origin and transit of migratory flows. With these partnerships, we want to help them make better lives for their people so that they can stay and prosper in their home countries instead of putting their lives in the hands of the smugglers in the Mediterranean in the Aegean or in the Atlantic. We also want to support them in strengthening their migration and asylum capacities, including through enhanced support to border management and counter migrant smuggling actions. We want to help them to address the root causes of irregular migration, not only by investment and money, but by creating an ecosystem of incentives that the European Union is capable of, from visas to trade preferences, and yes, why not, Erasmus scholarships, so that we have a comprehensive offer. We want to help them help us by stepping up return, readmission and reintegration arrangements 
And yes, President Sassoli said it very clearly, we want to help them to develop legal migration possibilities to the European Union. You may ask, why do you expect these new ideas to take off in practice this time when we failed to do it in the past? What has changed would be the legitimate question. Let me answer this by saying a lot has changed since 2015, 2016. First, for the first time, there is a clear evolution in the stance and the understanding of international partners. They do start to realize that migration has become an issue of central importance to our union, and many of them, particularly countries in our neighborhood, are often simultaneously themselves countries of origin, transit, and destination, and therefore they face similar challenges to those that we face. In other words, it is also to their own interest to prior prioritize sustainable solutions to migration and asylum management. The second thing that has changed is that contrary to 2015-16, when we had to strive to retrofit migration into our programs and find the money to be able to cope, by the way, with the enormous and very generous help of the European Parliament at the time, this time is different because this time we are planning our asylum policies at the start of a new EU budgetary cycle. So our external financing instruments have been designed to factor in migration considerations from the outset. And we intend to make a more flexible and strategic use of the programming of our external funding to achieve our objectives. The new Neighbourhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument, also known by the unpronounceable abbreviation NDT, was adopted, both by Parliament and the Council. And it includes for the first time a 10% target, over 8, million, 8 billion euros, specifically dedicated to migration. And finally, this time is different, because we now have a series of new innovating tools at our disposal that can operationally support the external dimension of the new pact. And these include the reinforced role of our new EU agencies, EASO for asylum and Frontex for border management, a more effective framework for returns to ensure that procedures are respected and work in practice, we also have the annual assessment of third countries' cooperation on readmission under the new visa code, which gives us an opportunity to take stock, discuss with partners, and propose concrete visa measures to incentivize cooperation. And we have also support to the reintegration of returnees as set out in our recently adopted strategy for voluntary returns. As far as legal migration arrangement is concerned, we have just launched, last Friday, a strategic discussion on talent partnerships between high-level representatives of member states and stakeholders. Our objective there is to significantly scale up the very successful pilot projects we are running now, which have indeed shown that the EU can successfully support member states in implementing legal migration schemes for the mutual benefit of partner countries, migrant workers, and employers. I'm highly encouraged that this new understanding of how important the external dimension of migration policy is shaping is now becoming a reality. For the first time after six years, we had a joint meeting of EU foreign and home affairs ministers together on the 15th of March under the Portuguese presidency. And that was a fantastic opportunity to reconfirm that Team Europe is playing together with the same objective, with the same strategic priority, and with the same mindset. Dear friends, I know that the pandemic will inevitably shape uh, our migration policies, and I know there is a panel that will discuss this later in more detail. What I would like to say is that as we start to get out of this global health uh, challenge 
and we start to gradually lift the restrictions, we need to make sure that our migration systems are ready fit to handle what comes next. And it's not a secret that the decline of socioeconomic conditions in third countries, the standstill in tourism has exacerbated many of the uh, trends that underlie the emergence of migration flaws. So we need to be able to cope and we need to be able to prepare. And this time we need to have the architects doing their job before the firefighters, as was the case five and six years ago. Let me conclude to say that it would be naive to build an EU migration and asylum policy on the assumption of a stable geopolitical environment around us. This will not happen. The recent events at the border of Ceuta and the past events, the border with Turkey, Nevros, were a stark reminder that Europe cannot afford to be complacent or unprepared. Reaching an agreement on the new Pact for Migration and Asylum as soon as possible should be a priority of the European Union and should be a priority across party lines and across national lines. We all know that the absence of a robust functioning single system for migration and asylum remains the biggest pull factor for irregular arrivals. The absence of an agreement is feeding the business model of the smugglers and taking a heavy toll on human lives. The European Union has the means, the tools, and the collective clout to put in place a system that works, a system that works in practice, and to build partnerships for the benefit of Europe, of our current country partners, of refugees and migrants alike. We do not need any more incidents like those in Ceuta or Evros to remind us. We do not need any more sunken boats and bodies washing ashore. We do not need any more reminders. We need to step up to the challenge, and the moment is now. Thank you. Obrigado, Sr. Vice-Presidente da Comissão Europeia, Margaritis. I'd like to thank the uh, President, uh, uh, Commissioner Skinas, and the Vice President of the EU. Here in L Lisbon, from the uh, Portuguese Parliament, I declare this uh, first session, the inauguration, uh, closed. So we can start immediately with the first session on the impact of the pandemic on uh, pa migration and asylum policies. And I'd like to thank you all for your participation.